Welcome to the deep dive. Today we're tackling a phrase that, let's be honest, can sound a bit heavy. Nursing theory. Yeah, it definitely sounds academic, maybe even intimidating. Right. Images of thick textbooks flash to mind. But what if theory isn't just classroom stuff? What if it's actually the, uh, the hidden compass for every nursing decision? That's exactly it. It's the why behind the what you do every single day. Think about building a house. You wouldn't just, you know, start putting up walls randomly. Absolutely not. You need that solid foundation first. Without it, the whole thing comes crashing down. And that foundation for nursing practice is theory. It keeps everything stable. So in this deep dive, we want to cut through the jargon. Give you a kind of shortcut to understanding that foundational why. Exactly. We'll unpack key ideas from your Fundamentals of Nursing textbook, make them really clear and, more importantly, relevant for you as nursing students. Our goal here is to show you theory isn't just for exams. It's absolutely vital for confident clinical judgment, crucial for patient safety. And for really getting patient-centered care. Yes. And it all ties directly into your NCLEX competencies. Honestly, you're probably using theory all the time without even labeling it. Okay, so let's start at the beginning. What actually is a theory, fundamentally? Well, at its core, a theory is a way to explain something. An event, maybe? How does it do that? It defines ideas or concepts, shows how they relate to each other, and uh, tries to predict outcomes. And for nursing specifically. A nursing theory takes that structure and applies it to some aspect of nursing. It could describe, explain, predict, or even prescribe nursing care. It gives you a lens to look through. Like using Orem's theory. Exactly. If you're using Orem's self-care deficit theory, you're specifically looking at what a patient can and can't do for themselves, their self-care needs. And the theory guides your interventions then. Precisely. I, it helps yeah. you figure out how to bridge those gaps, those deficits. Okay, so it provides focus. I often hear nursing called both a science and an art. How does theory fit in? That's a really good point. The science part is, you know, based on research, data. Right. The art comes from your experience, that unique, caring relationship you build. Theory kind of bridges those. How so? It gives structure to the art and purpose to the science. It helps define the focus, the methods, the goals of your practice. And importantly, it improves communication and accountability. Makes sense. What about meta theory? That sounds meta. It is. It's yeah. basically a theory about theories. It looks yeah. at the bigger picture, the relationships between different kinds of knowledge within nursing. It's the broadest level. So if theory is this foundation, what are the actual bricks, the building block? Good analogy. Yeah, a theory has components. Think of phenomena, concepts, definitions, and assumptions. They all work together. Okay, break those down. Phenomenon. A phenomenon is just the label we give to an idea or a response, something we observe. Right. In nursing, maybe caring, self-care, or patient responses to stress. It's a thing the theory is trying to explain. And concepts. Concepts are the words or phrases we use to describe that phenomenon. They can be abstract ideas, like coping or adapting. Or more concrete. Exactly. Like Nightingale, <laughs> talking about concrete things like physical conditions or the healthcare environment. So definitions make those concepts clear. Are there different types? Yes. Theorists need to be clear. So you have theoretical or conceptual definitions, like a dictionary definition, from their viewpoint. Okay. And then you have operational definitions. This is crucial. It tells you exactly how to measure the concept. Can you give an example? Sure. Pain might be theoretically defined as discomfort. But operationally, it might be defined as patient reports a score of three or higher on a 0-10 scale. Ah, so everyone measures it the same way. That's key for tracking progress. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Consistency across the team. Very important. And the last piece was assumptions. Assumptions are the statements that are just taken for granted within the theory, the underlying beliefs. Like? Watson's caring theory, for example, assumes that a conscious intention to care actually promotes healing. It's accepted as true for that theory. So if we were to visualize this, like in figure 4.2 in the text. Right. You'd see the phenomenon at the core. Okay. And connected to it, surrounding it, are the concepts, the definitions clarifying them, and the assumptions underpinning it all. It shows that interconnectedness. It really paints a picture of how it all fits together. It does. And that structure helps us understand the domain of nursing. Which is? Essentially our profession's territory. Everything nursing encompasses practice, history, theory, education, research. It gives us that comprehensive view. So the domain is the whole field. Then things like paradigms or conceptual frameworks 
help organize it. Exactly. A paradigm is like a model, a pattern of beliefs that links concepts and theories together. It helps us see the relationships. And the core one for nursing is the meta paradigm. Yes, that's fundamental. It helps answer, what is nursing? What do nurses do? And why do they do it? And it has four key concepts. Four pillars, you could say. Person, health, environment situation, and nursing itself. Okay, let's take those one by one. Person. The recipient of care. Could be an individual, sure, but also families, groups, whole communities. And the focus is always on them. Always. Patient-centered. And because people's needs are complex, care has to be individualized. Makes sense. How about health? It's more than just not being sick. Right? Definitely. Health is dynamic. It means different things to different people based on their values, lifestyle. So the nurse has to understand the patient's definition. Exactly. Your job is to provide the best care based on their current health level and their goals. Okay. Then environment situation. This is everything around the patient that affects them and their care. Their home, the hospital room, social factors. There's constant interaction there. Continuous. And it can be positive or negative. Right. Think Florence Nightingale, again, cleaning up the environment, reducing noise, improving light. That directly impacted recovery. Or like the teenager with diabetes example. Right. Their school, their job, social life, that's all part of their environment. And their care plan needs to account for it. And finally, the fourth pillar, nursing. This is the broad definition. Yeah. Care for all ages, families, communities, sick or well, in any setting. Including health promotion and prevention. Yes and care for the ill, disabled, dying. Crucially, it involves nursing assessment and diagnosis, like figuring out why a patient has fatigue related to activity intolerance. Which is different from the medical diagnosis, like heart failure. Exactly. Nurses use critical thinking, clinical judgment, to create those evidence-based patient-centered plans. That really clarifies that core framework. Thinking about how long nursing has used these ideas, uh, where did it all start? How did theory evolve? Well, Florence Nightingale is widely seen as the first nursing theorist. Back in the Crimean War. Yep. Her environmental theory was all about improving the surroundings, ventilation, light, hygiene, letting nature heal. She even practiced vital observation, a kind of early assessment. So practical, right from the start. Cleaning things up, watching patients closely. How did it grow from there? Well, things started to formalize in the 20th century. The curriculum era, say, 1900s to 1940s. That's when nursing school started focusing more on skills. Right. Expanding education beyond basic science to include social sciences, the nursing arts. Then came the research era, maybe 50s to 70s. When nurses started doing their own studies. Yes, trying to define what made nursing unique, separate from medicine. Around the same time, the graduate education era saw key theorists emerge. People like Orem, Rogers, King, Roy, developing more formal theories. We're leading into the theory era. In the 80s and 90s, yeah. Mm -hmm. Lots of knowledge development. The meta paradigm was formally proposed. More journals, more doctoral programs. And now? Now we're in the theory utilization era. The big focus is on evidence-based practice, EBP. Which comes from? From theory, from research, and from clinical experience combined. Those earlier grand theories set the stage, but now we use middle-range theories more often to provide specific evidence for EBP. It's amazing how they aren't static. They change with the times. Absolutely. War influenced Nightingale. The space program influenced Rogers' ideas about energy fields. Theories are dynamic. So understanding the history shows how nursing itself adapts. Okay, we have all these theories. Mm. How are they organized? Are there different types? There are. Different theories serve different purposes. Distinguishing nursing, guiding research, explaining why we do things. One way to classify them is by their level of abstraction. Picture a pyramid. Okay, guide me through it. Top level. Most abstract. Grand theories. Broad scope, complex. They try to answer the big question, what is nursing? They provide a general framework, but aren't usually specific enough for direct intervention guides. Like Imogene King's theory. Right. Focusing on that broad human environment interaction for health. Okay, middle level. Middle range theories. More focused, less abstract. They tackle specific phenomena, maybe comfort, uncertainty, social support. And they often build on grand theories. Often, yes. Or they come directly from research or practice. Kolkava's theory of comfort is a good example looking at physical, psycho-spiritual, environmental, sociocultural comfort needs. Much more specific. And the bottom of the pyramid, most concrete. That's practice theories, sometimes called situation-specific theories. These really bring theory to the bedside. How so? They guide care for a specific group of patients in a specific situation, well, like a pain management protocol just for post-cardiac surgery patients. 
they're usually easier to grasp and apply directly. So different levels of abstraction for different needs. The textbook also mentions goals, like in Box 4.1, improving practice, education, guiding research. Right, and setting quality standards. Theories also get classified as descriptive versus proscriptive. What's that distinction? Descriptive theories just describe phenomena and the conditions around them. Think growth and development theories. They help explain what you're assessing. Okay. Prescriptive theories go further. They address interventions, guide practice changes, and predict outcomes. They tell you what actions to take to reach a goal. Wiedenbach's theory is an example, guiding actions toward helping. It makes you think. Even on your very first clinical day, you're probably using these ideas without knowing the labels. Think about your last clinical shift. What kinds of theories, maybe descriptive or prescriptive, were you applying? That's a great reflection exercise. Now, nurses don't operate in a vacuum. We use theories from other fields too, right? Absolutely. We need a strong base from nursing, yes, but also from biomedical sciences, sociology, psychology. These are often called shared theories or interdisciplinary theories. Borrowed knowledge. You could say that. They were developed in other fields, but we apply them skillfully in nursing. Can you give a clear example of that? Sure. PH's theory of cognitive development, a psychology theory, helps pediatric nurses plan age-appropriate play therapy. Okay. Or Maslow's hierarchy of needs. That's huge for prioritizing care. Right. Basic needs first. Like, you can't effectively teach someone about their meds if they're in severe pain. Exactly. Physiological and safety needs come first. That's Maslow in action. These shared theories are essential for holistic care. And the nursing process itself, it's not a theory, but it's like a system that theory directs. Precisely. The nursing process, assess, diagnose, plan, implement, evaluate, is our systematic way to deliver care. Theory provides the knowledge for how to use that process effectively. How does the system analogy work, like in Figure 4.4? Think of it as a cycle. The input is the assessment data you gather from the patient. Okay. The output is the result, the patient's health status after your interventions. Does it improve, decline, stay the same? Feedback. That's information about how the system's working. Patient responses, family input, maybe consulting other providers. It helps you adjust the plan. And the content. That's the information generated by the system. Mm. Like through using the process, you might learn about common skincare needs for patients who can't move much in bed. It really shows how structured yet dynamic nursing care is. Okay, let's make this even more concrete. Let's talk specific nursing theories and how you use them. Nightingale's environmental theory. Give me a bedside example. Simple, but powerful. Making sure a patient's room is clean, quiet, has adequate light, fresh air, and that duty linens are removed quickly. That's Nightingale. Creating an environment where the body's natural healing processes can work best. Still relevant today. What about Peplaw's interpersonal theory? Often linked with psych nursing, but broader. Much broader. It's a middle-range theory focused on the relationship between the nurse, patient, and family. The key is using that therapeutic relationship to help patients turn anxiety into constructive action. Through different phases. Yes. Pre-orientation, gathering info. Orientation, defining the problem together. The working phase, where the therapeutic work happens. And resolution, summarizing and ending the relationship. The nurse plays different roles, resource, counselor, surrogate. Okay, let's try the scenario from the text. High school student, car accident, far from home, parents aren't there, first hospitalization. How does Peplo help? Well, first, you gather data, pre-orientation, then orientation. Yeah. Introduce yourself, build rapport, help the student voice their fears being alone, the unknown. Working face. You provide emotional support, clear information, maybe help them connect with family via phone. You act as that calm resource and counselor. Maybe even a temporary supportive figure, a surrogate. And resolution. As they stabilize and prepare for discharge, you help them process the experience and transition back. It's all about managing that anxiety through the relationship. That makes it very practical. Let's move to Orem's self-care deficit theory. Orem's is a grand theory used very widely. It's about assessing what a patient can do for themselves, their self-care agency, and where the deficits are. And the nurse steps in to fill those deficits. Exactly but only as needed. The goal is always to foster independence. If someone needs help with bathing initially, you provide it. But as they get stronger, you encourage and support them to do more themselves. So it's a constant assessment of their ability. Thinking about Orem's theory, how could you apply it right now to promote recovery and independence for one of your patients? Where are their deficits and how can you help them bridge that gap towards self-care? It prompts very targeted interventions. Definitely. And Leininger's culture care theory. Crucial in today's diverse world. 
Leininger stressed that caring is universal, but the expressions and practices of care vary hugely across cultures. So nurses need to be culturally sensitive. Absolutely. You need to understand and integrate the patient's cultural traditions, values, and beliefs into their care plan, like knowing how different cultures express pain or involving community leaders if that's important to the patient. It requires skillful assessment. Table 4.2 lists others too, like Henderson, Newman, Watson, Malaise, lots of different perspectives. Each offers a unique lens focusing on different aspects like basic needs, systems thinking, caring itself, or managing transitions. Okay, let's shift to something really critical for students right now. The NCSBN clinical judgment model. This is tied to the next gen NCLEX, right? Yes. It's incredibly important. The National Council of State Boards of Nursing developed this model to guide how clinical judgment is taught and evaluated. It's really about learning to think like a nurse. How does it work? Figure 4.5 looks layered. It is. Think of layers 0 and 1 as the foundation the patient's needs and your initial clinical judgments. Layer 2 is the cognitive process, how you actually think through a problem. And layer 3. Those are the six specific steps nurses use. Things like recognizing cues, analyzing cues, prioritizing hypotheses, generating solutions, taking action, and evaluating outcomes. You cycle through these repeatedly. And the outer layer. Layer four represents the context individual factors about the nurse and environmental factors that influence judgment. The whole model helps you make safe, effective decisions. So it's a map for decision-making to improve patient outcomes. Exactly. And it helps educators teach you how to navigate those complex situations you'll face. Okay, another reflection point. Think about a patient you cared for recently with a chronic condition. How could you apply those six steps of the NCSBN model to plan their care, prevent complications, and promote their self-management? Applying that model makes your thinking visible and systematic. Finally, let's connect it all back. Theory, research, and evidence-based practice. It's a cycle, right? It's a continuous loop. Nursing knowledge isn't just theory or experience. It's both. Theoretical knowledge from study experiential knowledge, the art of nursing from practice. Yeah. You need both for safe, comprehensive care. And figure 4.1 shows that interaction. Right. Theory guides your practice questions. Research tests those theories or generates new ones based on practice observations. And the results of research. They validate, refute, or modify the theory. And crucially, research findings provide the evidence for evidence-based practice. Are there different kinds of research involved? Yes. You have theory-generating research, which often starts with observations and practice and builds a new theory, like the theory of chronic sorrow developed from observing parents of kids with disabilities. Okay. And then theory-testing research, which takes an existing theory and sees how well it predicts outcomes or if its assumptions hold up in a specific situation. And both lead to EBP. Exactly. Both refine our knowledge base, giving us the high-quality evidence we need to provide the best possible care. This blend of science and art leads to what the text calls creative caring. I like that term, creative caring. What does that look like? It's when an expert nurse takes all that knowledge theory, research experience, and applies it in a unique, individualized way. Like the examples of arranging a pet visit or honoring a wish to die at home. Yes, or like in box 4.2, applying Melis's transitions theory. You're not just giving standard advice to new Karens, you're actively identifying support groups ensuring access to care, providing tailored education to help them successfully navigate that major life transition. That's creative, theory-informed caring. It's taking the principles and making them deeply human and specific. That's the essence of excellent nursing. So wrapping this up, theory really isn't just academic jargon. It's the absolute bedrock of nursing. It defines what we do, why we do it, and how we contribute uniquely to healthcare. It underpins research and guides safe, individualized care. We really hope this deep dive helps you see theory not just as something to memorize for a test, but as a toolkit to use actively. In every patient interaction, yeah. understanding these frameworks genuinely deepens your practice and helps you communicate more effectively with the whole healthcare team. So here's a final thought to carry with you. As you move forward in your nursing journey, how can a deeper grasp of these theories empower you to innovate? to advocate for your patients in ways you hadn't considered before. It opens up possibilities. Thank you so much for joining us for this exploration of nursing theory. We're really glad to have you as part of our learning community. Until next time, keep digging deeper.